talk will be about challenges for protecting native fish in the face of this hydropower boom that we're seeing across the world. So I'll talk about the global hydropower boom. I'll show you a map which shows how serious the, uh, the problem is and how widespread it is. And I say problem, not necessarily a problem, uh, but if it's uncontrolled and not done in the right way. Um, talk about the general impact of hydropower on society, the environment and biodiversity in general, but then focus a bit more on the impact on fish biodiversity and, and maybe some implications for fisheries as well. And I'll briefly introduce the Keep Fish project, which is this EU-funded project that we began in January. It runs for four years, and it's um, a project to build up a network to address this issue. And I'll just show you some early results that I've been working on in the last six months. So there's a global hydropower boom. It's kind of been referred to as the second great age in big dam building. And the main areas are... Uh, you know, Eastern Himalayas and Carpathian mountain ranges, the Himalayas, um, Southeast Asia, a neotropical South America, but also all along the Andes. Uh, so there are thousands and thousands of dams uh, under construction currently or, or planned, and, and these could be, um, I think these dams are all over five meters and they could be up to 100 meters plus in, in height. So they're pretty serious barriers um, and they fragment the river um, and they cause uh, lots of impacts in uh, social uh, impacts uh, I've got some some notes from a, an address by Michael Sonea from the World Bank to a UN, UN symposium in 2004 who identified these four main social impacts of course population displacement when a, a, a reservoir is created behind a dam the boom town formation around construction sites and of course the bust afterwards when the construction is completed, uh, changes to downstream agricultural production and loss of material cultural heritage. But the wider literature suggests that there are many other, perhaps less tangible social impacts, uh, the effects on non-material cultural life, uh, community health and gender relations, and of course wealth, wealth inequality, hydropower in many different ways tends to concentrate wealth and power into the hands of few. And this has led to lots of um, social activism around the world. This is from the Philippines. Um, this is in the Mekong Basin. And uh, most notably recently, a group called Patagonia Sin Represas has successfully lobbied the Chilean government to cancel permits for a huge hydropower scheme, which I think was five very big dams um, on two pristine rivers in southern Chile. Um, and of course the goodbye of Hydro Aysen, which was the name of the project. Um, the environmental impacts are also pervasive. Um, the main one is uh, an impact on the hydrological regime. So we get lower flows below um, hydropower dams. Um, we can get more variability over very short timescales, but in general, the variability of the flows is, is reduced as well and these flows are important for maintaining the habitat and for queuing a migration of fish and so on. But this causes water quality and water quantity issues for downstream users, it could be irrigation or subsistence fisheries for example. It's a lot of sediment is retained behind the dams and the sediment is also important for maintaining the river downstream uh, and deltas and uh, marine coastal habitats. Uh, this causes erosion and deposition downstream of the, of the dam and this can also cause uh, local flooding. And there are substantial methane emissions, particularly in, in areas closer to the equator. Um, and methane, of course, is a very effective uh, greenhouse gas and there's also huge CO2 emissions in, in the decades following damming. Um, <coughs> Another aspect of the impact is on biodiversity, and this is usually related to um, the change in the hydrological regime, the hydrological system. Um, and again, these are pervasive, so we get di direct displacement of species just as we do of people behind dams. The habitat downstream is degraded, lower diversity of floodplain habitats. Floodplain is, is less often inundated by the flow. 
And this acts on species selectively. It often favours invasive species. Um, it um, affects migratory fish uh, most severely, but also even for non-migratory fish, it limits dispersal and therefore gene flow makes populations fragmented and more vulnerable to extinction. And if you like your charismatic megafauna, then this is the Irrawaddy dolphin of the Mekong Basin and um, partly because of the huge hybrid development they've already seen there and they're facing more. Um, there were just 78 of these dolphins left, 78 individuals at last count. But we were interested in fish um, and this, this has kind of been neglected um, in, the, in the conservation arena. Uh, but recently there was a story published by The Guardian about the fact that it looks like the hydropower boom could threaten up to a third of the world's freshwater fish populations. And most of the focus has been on these so-called mega-diverse basins of the Amazon, the Congo and the Mekong, which are experiencing hydropower development to varying degrees. Um, and especially serious in the Mekong where up to 80% of the population in the basin rely almost completely on fish for protein. Um, so that's about 60 million people. And here are some projections about what will happen to the migratory stocks in the Mekong um, when the hydropower is fully developed here. But the majority of species will see up to, will see over 50% of their numbers lost. This is a serious impact on, on fisheries in this case, but also biodiversity. Um, so in all that, I think the, the point of um, beginning this project was that other areas of the world have been neglected away from these tropical areas, these mega diverse basins, but nonetheless areas that have high biodiversity concerns for other reasons. And one of these areas is the temperate regions of the south, the temperate south, where we have quite high levels of endemism and the species there are not necessarily very diverse, very numerous, but they're very genetically distinct. And um, they're indicated throughout Chile, southern Argentina, uh, New Zealand and southeast Australia by these two species shown here, the pouch lamprey, this ancient Agnathan jawless fish, um, Geoptria australis, and the um, uh, and Galaxias maculatus, known as Pujen in, in Chile, and is actually a feature of, the, of a small commercial fishery in Chile and a larger commercial and cultural fishery in New Zealand. And these are mainly what we would call non-sport fish, so very different from the salmon and trout that we often focus on in the Southern Hemisphere. Their body lengths are generally less than 15 centimetres when they're mature. This is a more or less complete list of the Chilean freshwater fish fauna. So you'll see it's not a case that there are particularly very many species, um, but these species listed in bold here are endemic to Chile and often endemic to a single river basin. And you'll see in the final column there that um, most of these species have a high conservation status. But at the same time, if we look at this map of global conservation funding, the deeper the red colour, the less uh, money is spent on conservation. Uh, Chile and some other areas of, of the world are among the lowest um, conservation spending globally, even given the fact that it's a biodiversity hotspot and also a hydropower hotspot. Also, I think fish have been neglected, as I mentioned earlier, and this is a a list that was compiled by the Zoological Society of London recently using some information from the IUCN uh, red list of species um, along with some genetic information about evolutionary distinctiveness and they don't list fish at all here. Uh, and this is a list that's having a lot of impact in the conservation uh, industry. So fish have been neglected to some extent uh, the temperate regions of the southern hemisphere where we've got hydropower development have been neglected. And for the temperate south, this is a, it's a particularly unique problem because of these fish communities made up of small bodied species. Um, and this is because small bodies generally means 
a low swimming capacity. So I've just gathered some data here on the, the maximum swimming speed of some of these non-sport fish compared to, say, an adult Atlantic salmon when they migrate upstream. So this is the body length that we typically have when they're migrating upstream and the, the corresponding swimming speed. This is a problem because where we've got a barrier and we build a fishway to mitigate the impact on fish movement, they're often quite high energy environments. It's a challenging environment for a, for a small fish. If this video works, I'll just show you. No, maybe. <laughs> maybe very loud. This is a fishway on the Murray River in Southeast Australia just to illustrate the very kind of energetic hydraulic environment. And for a small fish, this is really the challenge. So we established, uh, we applied for some money from the European Commission under Horizon 2020 and we got the money to form this network um, to look at this problem in more detail and to, uh, I'll show you what, what, what the aims are in the next slide. So we have partners from Europe and Denmark and Germany um, and the University of Southampton. We have two partners from Brazil. We have NIWA in New Zealand and the University of Melbourne, where, two places where I've been spending time so far this year. And of course the University of Concepcion, where Evelyn and Oscar are from. So the project plan, I'll just describe this to you briefly. Our aims were to, dis to, to establish design criteria for these fishways, for getting fish up and down through um, hydropower plants. And also importantly, I think, to say something about where hydropower should and shouldn't be developed uh, and to influence the policy and the scientific practice in, in these countries. Um, we're doing it through four work packages that all sort of fit together. I've been working on work package one which is we've been doing an, an evidence review and some modelling to establish these design criteria and I'll show you just a few slides about that shortly. At the same time, we've been running Work Package 2 where we're training uh, some PhD students from Chile uh, at European partner institutions and we'll be then cascading that training down to, to others in a summer school in Chile next year. And then going forward from there, um, Tom Wakeford is going to be working with us to co-construct a research strategy with, bet between us in a consortium and also with stakeholders, a broad spectrum of stakeholders and we'll be then moving on to, for, to get further funding to, to fund primary research, to fill these research gaps. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about how we're identifying research gaps in, in these design criteria. Uh, first, we need to think about the concept of fishway effectiveness. So here's a hypothetical hydropower barrier and a hypothetical fishway in plan view, and the flow is coming from top to bottom. Uh, so there are several aspects to fishway effectiveness that we need to think about, we need to design for, um, we need to think about the needs of different species. The first one is the, what we call the attraction efficiency. This is the number or the proportion of fish that want to move upstream, uh, that can find the fishway. And we think about how, uh, the proportion of those that can actually enter the structure. This can be a particular challenge, especially for small bodied fish. Then the proportion of those that make it through the whole fishway and move on upstream and then for downstream movement we can quantify the guidance efficiency so this is when we design bypasses um, to get fish downstream at, at, uh, and keep them away from dangerous parts of the infrastructure like the turbine so this is our <coughs> hypothetical turbine here and for those fish that do pass through the turbine um, we're, we're interested in the number of the pr proportion of those that are mortally injured um, so, based on each of those aspects of fishway efficiency, we wanted to see what design criteria uh, there was evidence for in the literature, uh, in the grey literature technical reports. So we came up with a list of 18 hypotheses, I won't go through them all in detail. There were sets of hypotheses for upstream passage, attraction, entrance and passage efficiency, and for downstream movement of fish, the guidance efficiency in the different sources of mortality as fish pass through 
hydropower turbines. We looked at a total of 630 papers and we went through a series of sque uh, a screening process and in the end we looked at 47 papers that contained 93 pieces of evidence across these 18 hypotheses. So we, we use this as uh, the PRISMA um, scheme for systematic reviews. Um, and the method we used to do the review was called, it's known as eco-evidence. This is a method that was specifically designed for systematic reviews in environmental science. And it was developed by the University of Canberra and the University of Melbourne, um, mainly to uh, support the development of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, which is this kind of unprecedented uh, legislation for returning um, megalitres and megalitres of water back to the environment. So they needed a method that was rapid, they needed a method that was very transparent, and um, this is what they came up with. So for each piece of evidence that you systematically search for, uh, you give it a weight based on the study design. So the more robust study designs, like the multiple before, after control impact studies get weighted higher, and the more replicates you have, the more weighting is applied to your piece of evidence. So for each piece of evidence you find, you sum up these study weightings, whether they support the hypothesis or refute the hypothesis. And I'll just briefly show you the results of that uh, systematic review. And here in the top right hand corner I've just shown the kind of arbitrary thresholds we use for deciding whether there's enough support or whether there's insufficient evidence or inconsistent evidence when you get a large number of studies that support and refute the hypothesis. It's just to show that each of these data points reflects one of the 18 hypotheses. It's just to show that most of them here are plotting in there lower left hand corner where we've got insufficient evidence in the literature to support the design. And for those that we do have some evidence for, sometimes that's inconsistent, sometimes it's close to the boundary, and almost always it's for uh, just one aspect of fishway design, and this is getting fish upstream through the fishway. And it's not about attracting migrating fish or getting them into the fishway, uh, even though this is where we know that many fishways fail there's been a disproportionate um, focus on upstream passage. Overall, there's very little evidence to support uh, fishway design, and this risks the creation of ecological traps. If, if, we get, if we successfully get fish upstream, in the next part of their life cycle, they need to move downstream, uh, and, and they can't do that if we haven't designed the downstream passage effectively. So this risks the creation of ecological traps and local extinction. And in the absence of sufficient empirical evidence, we, we must use the combination of data that we have, along with expert judgment and where we can with local knowledge. And this really should involve biologists, engineers and social scientists. So at this point I'll hand over to, who wants to go first? Perhaps the biologist, seeing as you were first in the list there. Yeah. Uh, I'll introduce Evelyn Habit. Um, Evelyn's a biologist from Concepcion, as I said earlier, and she's been working on many aspects of conservation for, I'll say many years, but not that many years. <laughs> Recently. Recently. Thank you, Martin. Okay, thank you. Um, I will start just Thank you, Martin, for having us here. And this is a great opportunity. And all of you for being here. Ian, thank you for coming. Uh, second, I like to apologize for my English. I expect that you understand what I'm going to try to explain now. As Martin said, um, we are looking for challenge for protecting native fish. And I'm a fish biologist, so I'm talking about the biological approach and, uh, of course, trying to explain our reality uh, about this fish fauna in our country, in Chile. Before that, let me just very briefly present our university. This is Universidad de Concepcion, it's the main campus uh, in, in the city of Concepcion. This is the 
Middle East University in regions. Our country is very centralized in Santiago, which is the capital. But outside from that, southern from Santiago, this is the biggest university. And in particular, we, uh, I'm a professor from the Faculty of Environmental Science, which tend to be multidisciplinary. It has three departments. I belong to the Government of Aquatic System. And also we have the Environmental Science Center, EULA, um, for doing more applied uh, research. So three, the, those three buildings belong to the Faculty of Environmental Science. We have one uh, undergrad career, which is environmental engineering, and also this doctoral program in environmental science with specialization in continental aquatic systems. So what I'm I, 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 I saying here is that almost all our work is around uh, freshwater eco ecosystems. Well, this is the outline of my presentation. Um, I will present you first uh, why we say that Chile is a biogeographical island. Then I will talk uh, briefly about our native fish fauna. Uh, why we are concerned about the fragmentation issues in, uh, for this fauna. And finally, I will present very briefly one of our ongoing projects. Uh, well, Chile, South America. No? And Chile is really a very narrow and long stretch of land going from the 17 degrees Celsius, um, Celsius, no, latitude <laughs> south, <laughs> 54 degrees latitude south. Um, as you see here, it's a narrow country. The average width is 200 kilometers. Um, we have the Andes mountain range in the east and then the Pacific Ocean uh, in the west. Uh, in the north, we have the Atacama Desert and the south Patagonia, which was recently uh, glaciated. So that's why we say we are really a um, biogeographical island. You see here our territory is very long, almost 5,000 kilometers long. Um, so we have this very high diversity conditions, environmental conditions, from deserts to large ice fields in the south, um, very um, heterogenic in terms of geology and topography. We also have many active volcanoes along uh, our, uh, our mountain range. Uh, we also are a country vulnerable to natural disasters, and recently, in 2010, we have an 8.8 .8 earthquake in Concepcion, where we live, so it's usually that at least every Chilean person uh, survived to one earthquake during their life. And also, uh, because the country is so narrow, we have uh, the climate is highly influenced by the oceanic currents. Uh, we have the Humboldt current going from south to north with very cold water, but usually we have this event of La Niña or Niño changing the temperature and that completely change the, the climate in, in the country. So it's a very particular uh, area. Uh, talking about biodiversity hotspots, they have been defined many, I have 54, 55 uh, hotspots around the world, and they are characterized by both uh, having exceptional levels of endemism, but also because uh, they have several levels of habitat loss, and one of the biodiversity uh, is in Chile. So, the Chilean hotspot is the Chilean winter rainforest, Valdivian forest. And as you can see in the red uh, square there, it's the green part of Chile where the rainforests are. Uh, but this is, it is not also a terrestrial biodiversity hotspot. It, it is also a freshwater hotspot. So more than 80% of our freshwater species occurs in this area. Uh, with high levels of endemism, and the other characteristic is that this is a primitive uh, fauna, where in general, of uh, with organic origin. So they keep retain many primitive characteristics. Um, in this area of the hotspots, also the 
configuration of the rivers are very particular because we have all these basins going from east to west, so short rivers, very high energetic, um, and, and they run parallel in their distribution from <coughs> north, north to south in the latitudinal gradient. Uh, and they have been isolated for many years, uh, so they accommodate this very particular fish fauna in each of these basins. And south from the hotspot, the hotspot is in red there, south from the hotspot we have Patagonia. Patagonia is a biogeographical um, region shared with Argentina in this case, and really the species region is in endemism is lower, but even though uh, the biota there is, is highly singular too because they are very particular geology history and because these are really pristine ecosystems below. <coughs> so, Rujet uh, Sayedal, in his paper from 2006 in Science, um, put uh, Patagonia one of the most important places for, uh, as, as global biodiversity conservation is priority uh, around the world. What about our native fish fauna? Well, first, it's important to say that even though we have this very broad bioclimatical scenario and all this diversity that I uh, showed before, we only have 45 native freshwater fish in these uh, rivers here. And they have very different uh, origins. These are a complex group of fish. Some of them coming from the Brazilic region, the, uh, a few of them, like parasitic forms. Uh, we have many endemic forms from the area, uh, mainly silverform catfish, and the other common uh, or shared with uh, Australian region, uh, like uh, the ones that mentioned Martin before, galaxies mainly. The main characteristic of this group of species of 45 species is that 82% of them are endemic from Chile. So if we lost them in Chile, they disappear completely. Uh, their conservation status is very poor, more than 50% and are endangered species. And another characteristic which is important is saying that when adults, they get very small sizes. And this is an important characteristic, not only in the ecological and biological sense, but also because the problem of being small is that people don't know our native species. And the, if you ask to the majority of persons in Chile about what are our native fish, they will say salmons, and we don't have salmons. Salmon, salmonids are completely uh, introduced in Chile, they, they belong to the northern hem hemisphere. So and that's, I think, uh, one of the consequences to be small fish. They are not charismatic species. Pardon them, and important, and I love them. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, we have few uh, migratory species. For example, this one, this is the same uh, Georgia Australis that uh, Martin showed before, but this is um, um, larger stage. Um, the, the, these are uh, migratory species. Uh, it's a kind of um, anadromous species. But, of course, it is not of social or economic concern like the others. So we have this problem of protecting a very particular singular endemic fish fauna, but with no uh, social importance. And, and then makes a, um, a problem for how uh, to motivate people to, to be concerned about that. Uh, just like a summary, uh, so this uh, fish fauna is characterized by being primitive, high endemism, low species resistance, poor conservation status, very small belly size, and also I have to say that uh, unfortunately we still have many knowledge gap about their even very basic biological characteristics and ecology. Okay, <coughs> sorry, why are we uh, concerned about this 
connectivity issues. So I will briefly talk about the uh, uh, intra-basin level and then inter-basin level. We are very, our main concern, of course, about having uh, this river fr uh, having fragmentation is that both the hotspot, uh, biodiversity hotspot in the northern part of Patagonia face a high pressure to hydropower generation. And then this map you can see in the first, these green dots are the current dams, which are mainly small dams, not big, not large ones. But we are expecting in the near future to have much more. And Oscar is going to develop more of this um, idea, the, the problem that we have. And of course, uh, fragmentation is not the only problem that these fish are uh, having. It's only one more threat. Uh, our basins have multiple stressors uh, in addition to fragmentation. Pollution, for example, changes in geomorphology, and a lot of problems with species, invasions, including salmonids, um, that everybody loves, but they are uh, really a big concern too. And nobody really knows what is going on with the additive and synergistic effects that all these uh, problems are uh, provoking in, in our rivers. So I will tell you uh, something about um, why we have concerns uh, of protecting this fish fauna uh, uh, from fragmentation first at the intra-basin level. So I will take this example, which is the Valdivia River Basin, southern from Concepcion. Um, it's a very particular basin with eight lakes in the headwaters and then one uh, river draining all these lakes, which is the San Pedro River. And as you see here, there is a project of a, a dam still not built. Uh, it's applying for the permissions of the environmental agencies. Um, but it will be built <laughs> in any way. Uh, so we, we have been working in this basin for many years, looking for different characteristics of the fish, and I will show here only two that um, make us really concerned that even these fish species are not migratory, they need some movements and connectivity uh, in the river for uh, com complete their life cycles. So here is the basin, the eight lakes, the all, all of them draining through the San Pedro River. Uh, so here is um, a zoom of that area, and the dots are all our uh, sampling station. That's the case of Galaxias maculatus. And you can see that we uh, measured um, movement of this very small fish as long as 40 kilometers downstream. Also, some small upstream movements. Uh, three, four kilometers, but uh, what we are uh, saying here is, of, of course, they have these movements um, and they are mainly passive, so it's important to keep the downstream uh, connectivity for, for them. And this can be more clear uh, when you look at the genetic diversity patterns and each of these um, diagrams belong to a different species. And what they show, you can interpret this, each of these circles uh, as one gene, and the size of the circle is the frequency with, in which it is present in the population. Uh, and colors correspond to different areas of the um, river network. So, you can see that in the same river, in the same river basin, and in this case, these eight uh, native species have very different uh, genetic patterns. For example, if we look at this one, the Diplomyces camposensis, which is endemic from the basin, it has very low genetic diversity, few genes uh, in, the, in the populations. But all the genes are present in all the areas of the basin. That means this low genetic diversity is shared along all the basin, along the river. 
different, for example, this one is a very high diversity, genetic diversity, diverse species. Or look at this one, uh, it's also very diverse, but it, be, it behaves like very particular populations. So the blue genes, uh, <laughs> the blue uh, circles here are only present in some place in the basin, completely separated from the red or from the green. So that means that this species is like naturally fragmented. Uh, they don't have a lot of gene flow. Uh, probably it's more clear here, it's the same basin, lakes upstream, then the river downstream, and here six species, and the arrows shows the amount of gene flow between the different places of the basin. And again, Diplomistas Camposensis, the one who is uh, microendemic from this basin, you see, it has a lot of gene flow, both upstream and downstream. And we identify here a population which can be um, identified as a source population of genes for all the, the basin. And the future dam is planned exactly here. So, of course, this species will be much more affected by the fragmentation than this one, for example, that even has very, very low gene flow uh, along the, the basin. So that's important. The, the general message here, and that's why this paper um, calls idiosyncratic patterns, is that it is very species specific, and you have to have this knowledge before uh, making the fragmentation for knowing what is the better mitigation action for each species. And then at the interbasin levels, because I already said we have these parallel basins and uh, each of them accommodate a unique fauna. So again, here, this is a study with the group of the same catfish, but now looking of all the species, and there are species, species described for Argentina and for Chile, and this genetic um, this genetic study shows that all the populations present, all the individuals present in Argentina, they share the same gene pool, they are just like the same, and, and, and they are also present in southern Chile, in the, in the northern part of Patagonia, where the hydroisen project was planned. But look at the other basins, almost every basin has a different group of uh, genetics uh, uh, population. Yeah. They are primarily freshwater fish, they don't go to, to the sea. But interestingly, we found in this area, this brown um, basin, uh, with some genes from the southern basin, the, the yellow one. And that was surprising for us. Why? If they are so separated basin, they are sharing some genes. So our next study was trying to explain that. Uh, so this is the brown one, Rappel basin, and southern, the yellow one, Mataquito basin. That's the genetic arrangement that we found, completely mixed. So we tested two hypotheses for explaining this genetic composition. And the first one is that this is explained because the split of the two basins uh, many years ago. You know? And the second, the, the second hypothesis is that there are current uh, population connectivity. And of course, the, the um, hypothesis that was strongly supported was the second one. And we think this is because there is a irrigation channel that's, that is uh, connecting the two basins. Yeah? This is the Teno Timberongo irrigation channel. So we think that these fish are uh, using this irrigation channel as a new habitat, and then they are mixing uh, something that was for thousands of years separated. And also because we uh, have been working 
looking how this fish community used the habitats, we know that these species of diplomistes use the areas with high turbulent energy um, and vortices, very similar to trout. So it's possible that they are using these irrigation channels as our habitats. Uh, even if we compare here different native species and uh, the rainbow trout in habitats of different turbulence energy, we see that the adults of these diplomistes uh, really have a high range of uh, and very high in relation to the other species using uh, habitat with high turbulence energy. Then uh, we think that the hypothesis is plausible and, and is possible. So um, that um, brings us to our ongoing project, which is, uh, we call them within basin barriers and among basin leaks, seeing connectivity of rivers in central Chile and its impact on native fish. Uh, this is a um, project where Oscar is a um, co-PI, and also Dr. Conrad Worski and Dr. Daniel Rosante from Dalhousie, Canada, uh, Dalhousie University in Canada. And our main uh, object is establish understanding of the relationship between river connectivity and native Chilean fish dispersal. So this is our study area, eight basins, these eight basins along the hotspot, uh, biodiversity hotspot. Uh, we choose these basins because here is the highest concentrations of hydropower plants, roads, and agriculture. Um, and we are trying to answer these big questions, so it's challenging. Uh, the first one is how severe really is are connectivity alterations in your basins due to fragmentation by dams and interconnections by irrigation channel. And there we have uh, three PhD students working and one GAE specialist. Um, what are really the main dispersal pattern of the different species? Uh, and then we have two approaches here. Uh, potential uh, looking and, and uh, studying the swimming capacity in lab experiments. And here is working mainly the group of Oscars students. And we also will measure the actual uh, dispersal using analysis of microchemistry, microchemistry of otoliths. Uh, then we are also interested in how do connectivity change affect gene flow and genetic diversity of fish species with different dispersal abilities. So we choose two species, one with high dispersal capacity and the other with very low. And here we have another uh, PhD student, Francisca, who was by Kipfish in Denmark recently, working with, with Dr. Daniel Rosante. Um, we're interested in understanding uh, how the diversity respond to this uh, fragmentation and among connectivity again to PhD students. Uh, and finally, how to improve the impacted longitudinal connectivity by developing these efficient fish passes for Chilean native fish. And here, of course, uh, Oscar Link is leading this part. And um, his students, Anita and Claudia, and Anita also is uh, doing a research, research stay here in, in, now she's in Southampton. Uh, thanks to the Kipfish project. So that's what we are doing right now, the many uh, different projects, and that's it. Thank you for your attention. We'll save the questions to the end if we have time. Okay. <coughs>
Hand over to Oscar then for some more fishy business. <laughs> yeah, okay. Good afternoon. Thank you for to be here. Thank you, Martin, for the invitation also. Uh, I am a civil engineer, so I never expected in my career to work uh, with fishes mainly. Uh, I have learned a little bit in the last years about this, but my main aim in this project is to develop fishways design criteria. So I will present you some uh, first results on what we have been done in the last three years, basically. Uh, and this is, uh, of course, uh, have been done in, in, in the frame of both projects that were already mentioned. One, the first one is together with Evelyn, is founded by the Chilean uh, Research Council, and the second one is together with Martin, is the Keep Fish uh, project. And the results I will present uh, were also developed uh, working with Pedro Arriaga, he's a, another PhD student, René Ibarren, he's our very good technician at the laboratory, Anita, Claudia and Adrian were working a lot with uh, um, swimming tunnel and a colleague from the University of Sheffield, uh, he's not a photographer, he's a specialist in fluid mechanics and he was collaborating a lot uh, for PIV uh, measurements in, in the laboratory in Chile. So the outline of the presentation contains um, a brief description of the Chilean case again, but from the perspective now of the engineer, uh, with a new problem definition, or a quite uh, slightly different, uh, then some needs in standard hydraulic design of fish waste. And then I will present you two sets of, of results, one uh, containing uh, aspects regarding the swimming capacity of our non-sport fishes and the second set is uh, <coughs> on the fish behavior in wake vortices and finally I will conclude with the question if we are better after all this stuff so what Evelyn mentioned uh, we have a, a very unique uh, ichthyofauna with high degrees of endemism here I put some pictures of typical sites where small hydropower dam uh, are planted in Chile. These uh, are located in the central part of the country and typically we are talking about uh, very short rivers uh, with lengths about uh, 100 to 380 kilometers lengths, very steep ones, so very good for hydropower. They uh, start in the high Andes at in the glaciers at altitudes between 3,000 and 6,000 meters over sea level and they flow parallel uh, into the Pacific Ocean. Typically these are unregulated rivers, means that they follow the natural regime of precipitations with high uh, precipitation in winter and mean annual discharges at the mouth ranging between 100 and 1,000 cubic meters per second. Means these are not really large rivers, they are middle size. Mm -hmm. And especially in the central part of the country, uh, you see here a, a map. We have the main city, Santiago is here somewhere. Concepcion, where we live, is here. And we have roughly 10 uh, main basins. Uh, with 10 rivers, and there we uh, find uh, 88 already existing hydropower plants which complain 7.2 gigawatts uh, power. And in the same region, we have 95 planet hydropower plants. Planet means that they are already approved for, uh, through the environmental agencies or under construction. And with this 95 uh, planet hydropower plants, we will reach uh, a capacity of 3.5 gigawatts. So you see that these sites are already not as good as the first one that are already uh, implemented. And apart from these uh, 183 plants, uh, our Ministry of Energy uh, expects 
around 1,000 new small hydropower plants. <clears throat> so this small diagram here comes from a report from the Energy Ministry. And what you see here is the power plant capacity in megawatts. And here you see in logarithmic scale the number of new projects that are expected according to the available hydropower. Uh, so we see that for mega uh, power plants there are not many good sites available already. So we expect maybe a handful of uh, new big uh, plants, but a big concern is this year we expect around 1,000 new projects with um, roughly 1 or 2 megawatts power. Why is this of concern? It's because we can overlap now this region with these 10 basins with the hotspot of biodiversity that Evelyn already mentioned. And we see for the same 10 basins here, um, we are talking from the number 7 up to here somewhere, the 13 we see that the highest uh, number of species, uh, of fish species, is present uh, in the same basins. So if we overlap the information, we see that uh, between <coughs> the rivers Maipo and Imperial, we have uh, 33 of the 45 uh, fish species of Chile inhabiting this, uh, this part <coughs> and of these uh, 30 species between Maipo and Imperial, 20 inhabit at Piedmont, means where typically uh, these power plants will be built, 24 of them are endemic, 26 are endangered or vulnerable and 11 of the 30 are small bodied, means less than 15 centimeters when adults. And mostly, as already mentioned, these are non-migratory species uh, that depend somehow on the longitudinal river connectivity. And the interruption of connectivity uh, or fragmentation of the, of the habitat is one of the main effects, negative effects of hydropower plants on, on rivers. So we are focusing on, on this uh, impact that affects connectivity, not only of the physical habitat of aquatic and terrestrial organisms, but as well energy and nutrient flows. And why is that so important? We can make an analogy uh, of river health with the human body. And we have several different aspects like hydrology, physical habitat, geomorphology, biology, water quality. And then in, in these terms, real health will depend on connectivity. And connecti connectivity is uh, multidimensional. We can distinguish the longitudinal connectivity, which is, which is associated with the river continuum concept, uh, where high flows of energy and matter occur but also the lateral connectivity uh, when you think on the connection between the river and the riparian ecotone, uh, the exchange uh, with the terrestrial ecosystem and floodplains inundation, as well as the vertical connectivity uh, connecting the river with the hyperrake flow, upwelling <coughs> and downwelling uh, exchanges. And of course also we have the temporal dimension, which means the discharge regime. Um, and our anthropic activities can reduce connectivity due, due to fragmentation uh, and of course longitudinal connectivity is the most important dimension for, for fishes especially. So to provide connectivity there are, there is, we, we don't have the best solution. Um, one possible way to solve the problem or at least to mitigate the problem is to uh, develop fishways, and that's what uh, we are trying to do. And there are already uh, many uh, fishway design 
white lines. Uh, they focus on migratory species from the northern hemisphere, <coughs> mainly salmonids. Uh, anyway, the efficiency of existent uh, fish waste is relatively low. Um, and when you try to design a new fish way, you see that uh, the design relies on bulk flow variables. There is less integration of fish preferences in flow fields through quantitative methods. Guidelines usually refer to recommendations from experience, and those are not really applicable to new cases, to new species. And this is a, a, a main um, issue when, when you try to design a fishway for these non sport fishes in the southern hemisphere. Moreover, as our species are non-migrating, uh, we uh, face the problem that our, our goal with the fishway is not necessarily that the fish passes through the fishway. We just need to provide connectivity. Yeah, but it, it is not uh, mandatory that the fish enters and goes out in a short period of time. Could be part of the habitat. And uh, newly, the tendency is to try to design multi-species fishways. So additionally, we want to build such kind of, of waterworks for uh, suitable for different species. We have a scale problem. Uh, here, of course, is very, very exaggerated, but you see uh, our very small fishes are not really comparable uh, directly to big, uh, large salmonids. And thus, uh, we are trying to follow a dimensionless uh, approach, uh, trying to develop dimensionless parameters that represent well uh, different species uh, making everything more comparable. For instance, the relative flow to fish uh, swimming velocity, uh, things like relative pass lengths uh, to swimming distance, and more complicated stuff like fruit numbers, rainbows number, energy parameters, accelerations. But uh, more interesting may be uh, things related to turbulence, uh, there you see intensity, periodicity, and size of the vortex, vortices is important, and we have some uh, scales here, for, for instance, for the sizes. We have the diameter of the vortices can be uh, very uh, important for the fish behavior, when related to fish lengths. Um, and we started with uh, three species, which are which are very different. Actually, it's like it, it, this is not intended to be a, a comparison between apples, peaches, and, and bananas. Uh, <laughs> that's why I put it here. Uh, this is uh, Trichomycteus aerolatus. It's an angiform fish, it's bentonic. Uh, Cairon galuste. There is a subcarangiform fish and Basilictis is a carangiform fish. So the swimming mode of these three species is uh, different because they use uh, a different portion of the body for propulsion, basically. And we just took a look at the swim tunnel to see what they do, how they behave, and also how, they, how, how much they swim, trying to determine their critical velocities. And first I show uh, the Trichomycteros aerolatus, uh, which uh, actually was not really uh, a standard fish. Uh, usually due to reotaxis, fishes stand in the, in the current and start to swim to hold the position in, in, the, in the water. So when the fish uh, stops swimming, uh, you say that's the maximum flow velocity that fish can resist somehow. It's called the critical velocity. But here you see the behavior of the Trichomycteros aerolatus that is just doing different things, but not really swimming in the current. So um, 
we found some, some patterns of, of behavior related to different velocities here in this graphic uh, expressed in body lengths per second and you see that the number of attempts uh, to move uh, increased a little bit for some uh, specific velocities and you see also that for 10 body lengths per second flow velocity the fish didn't really do anything else. The other two species were more collaborative in this sense. Um, here you see Basilictis. This is uh, the standard behavior that you expect uh, for a fish. He's just uh, keeping its position, swimming at the same velocity as the flow is flowing. And with this kind of information, you can build design curves. Um, here you see the fish weight lengths. And here the maximum allowable velocity um, that would be possible for the fish to, to keep in order to pass the fish weight. Uh, with the Kelvin, I don't know if it is uh, large enough, the, the image. Here you see four videos, uh, actually with different velocities. The same fish at seven centimeters per second is doing nothing at 7.6 uh, centimeters per second is just uh, looking around somehow not really swimming but when you increase a little bit more the velocity uh, to 10.8 centimeters per second you see that he's swimming he's trying to hold position but not in a continuous manner he's uh, doing uh, a, or, or adopting a, a style call it burst and coast, means it makes a burst, then the body is straight, it, he stops moving the, um, the body, no propulsion is there, and just comes the coast facet. And if you increase the velocity significantly, here we see 34 centimeters per second, the fish uh, reduces the coastal facet, and a uh, burst is just applied in order to uh, swim against the the current. So for a certain velocity uh, this individual will not be able to swim further and will collapse here against the, the grid. This is called then the critical velocity. And with that information we know how long uh, and how fast the fish can swim and we can compute this kind of curves. But this is uh, valid only for a very uh, uniform flow, a, an open channel flow, without induced turbulence due to geometry. In fishways, however, especially in nature-like fishways, we have configurations like the one in this uh, picture. Here you see uh, a fishways, uh, call it a rock ramp. This uh, circles here uh, represent boulders that are placed at, as bluff bodies in the, in the flow and uh, you see here in colors the velocity magnitude that was measured in, in the laboratory so you see that this kind of configuration produce a variety of velocities in the flow field that the fish must somehow sort so we decided to uh, design a very simple experiment in order to investigate a little bit more in depth the behavior of this species in a cylinder wake. And just uh, to illustrate the situation, here you see the cylinder placed in an open channel flow and you see here the tracers that uh, allow the visualization of the cylinder wake. So we have wake vortices here that will interact somehow with the fishes. And of course, parallel to this PID, uh, for which we get uh, Werner Brevis from Sheffield for the processing of the data. Oh, this video is not working, doesn't matter. Here we see the Basilictis or swimming as before in the free flow very standard behavior, but in the uh, wake of the cylinder is uh, attuning the, the, the position of the body, of the body center, 
and trying to sort the vortices around the being of, of the vortex. This is uh, already a documented swimming style called the Karman gating. Uh, it was observed for rainbow trout in other special conditions and we have the same or very similar for, for basilites. Cagodon instead is here in free flow doing this burst and coast swimming and it performs similar uh, in the presence of a cylinder wake as you see here but we also observe that usually when it comes into the cylinder wake it suffers destabilization destabilization and also sometimes uh, they perform some drift events so we are trying to um, to quantify now statistics about the tail bit kinematics and to relate this tail bit kinematics with the uh, cylinder and wake properties. So these are some preliminary results, but I don't think that's that interesting. As conclusions, I would say Chilean non sport species show it as similar, these uh, two species, Basilitis and Cagodon similar and strong swimming capacities so based only on, on these uh, endurance curves multi-specific fishways were sinkable for us but when we uh, performed the experiments on fish behavior uh, and interaction with turbulence we see that uh, Basilictis was comfortable in the waves um, so that we think bluff bodies could be uh, sinkable as resting zones or maybe stimuli for passage uh, but Keodon was stressed in the wakes and so bluff bodies if uh, used at all maybe would serve as comportamental barriers and forthcoming we are building also at the laboratory a kind of prototype of a fish ramp this is Anita who will return to Chile uh, next month, I think, and she will uh, continue with this work uh, looking at the efficiency for passage with these different species, going now to a scale that is more closer to the, to the real one. That's all I, I have prepared for you. Thank you. Thank you.